Hello, everybody, and welcome to Art Seminar. Um, today, we're featuring uh, a visiting artist to Minot State University, Ronaldo Gil Zambrano, who is here with us from Spokane, Washington. Um, he is a, a relief printmaker specializing in, in woodcut relief, uh, and he's an assistant professor of printmaking at Gonzaga University in Spokane. Um, he's on campus working with Flat Tail Press to do uh, a print edition, so if you have a chance, be sure to go up to the printmaking studio and check out what he's working on. It looks to be an amazing print. Um, and he also has an exhibition in the Northwest Art Center right now. Um, it's his best of show solo exhibition from Paperworks uh, 2019. So without that, I'll go ahead and introduce Ronaldo. And we can start. We can give him a hand. We can give him a hand. <laughs> Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Great, well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for uh, having me here and giving me the opportunity to speak to you about a little bit about my experience, um, what I have been doing so far for the last few years into the art making process. So yeah, so that's my name. I come from Caracas, Venezuela, and where I come from, we have really long names. That's why they're really popular in soap operas, for example. But yeah, so I grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, uh, the, the capital city. Um, as you can see right there, um, it's a city that's pretty much like divided by the ones that have and the ones that have not. And everything that you see right there is basically divided by a river that goes and divides the city in half. So it's a constant interaction between these two worlds somehow. But at the same time, as you can see on the left side, there is all these tiny little houses that are part of the barrios or the slums. Um, it's just like a million people living there and there is just so many different stories right there. So in Venezuela, one thing that we love to do and then, I mean, and when I moved to Costa Rica, I started to appreciate it in, other, in other places, is that we love to tell stories. So no wonder, Magical realism is one of those like bigger literature movements that appear there in Latin America, but also um, I grew up like fascinated with children books illustrations, especially uh, children books by Rosana Farias, which is a Venezuelan artist that you can see right here. And that was somehow my introduction to books. I, I mean, I like to read, but I mean, what always fascinated me was pretty much the images and the colors and somehow uh, how people can tell stories through, not only by their body language, but also through images. So the way that I have been divided this uh, presentation is basically in three main components. And one of them is pretty much a storytelling. So when I moved to Costa Rica first, I lived there. Uh, for two years, when I was 16 years old, I went to this international school and I was surrounded by 70 people from uh, 68 different countries. So I didn't know how to speak French or I didn't, I didn't know how to speak English, which is something I continue to uh, work on. But I just, uh, I just knew how to speak Spanish, but it was really hard to communicate with everybody. But I realized that just getting together with other people um, and using uh, drawings, I could communicate with them. But then later on, I, was, uh, I had a roommate from Vietnam, and he introduced me to tofu. So if you ever had uh, eat tofu, like it has by itself, it doesn't really have a lot of flavor. But somehow, when you put it into a broth, it just becomes this exquisite uh, thing, right? Because it just enriches the, the flavor from the sauce, and it somehow uh, combines with the unique flavor of the tofu, and it becomes something very unique and interesting. So the way that I have been somehow like developing my work is basically something similar to a social tofu, where I have been somehow like incorporating myself into different communities in different countries, and I have been able to somehow like uh, collect all these different stories that later on enrich my visual narrative. So this is a picture of those 70 different people in that school in Costa Rica in a long time ago when we were allowed to actually hang out all together which is something that doesn't happen anymore here. So then later on after Costa Rica, I moved um, to the United States to pursue um, my BFA in arts. And I started to think a little bit about the idea of memories, um, how I could somehow understand the idea of home. You know, this like, what exactly is home? Like, is the place where I come from? Is the place where I am? Is the place where I was when a child? 
So I started to somehow rely and um, uh, explore my own memories as a way to somehow understand this concept. So I started just to rely on drawings, especially uh, ink drawings on paper that were uh, visiting some of those like ideas and iconographies from the barrio where I grew up. And also trying to think about like the, all, all the different characters from this place that sometimes we don't really pay too much attention, which will be, for example, a dog. So how will, will a dog see this barrio, right, when it's running around? And then, of course, like, um, I started uh, relying a lot into the news and reading news from Venezuela. Um, most of the news that I read from, especially from the barrios, was this idea that somehow everything related to the slums or the barrios is like all about violence and drugs. But my experience was totally different. I felt that the barrio was pretty much like a family that somehow was ideal for the kids that were growing, the, uh, growing up there. Um, it was a place where we can nurture our childhood and somehow uh, become adults later on. So I started like drawing this, uh, uh, this idea of like somehow the barrio is becoming kind of like a resembling a face that is, uh, is after the name of my grandma and somehow like uh, allowing this individual to be pretty much like safe and, and grow. But also no, um, I had the opportunity to study under Goran Fasil, which is my professor from Bosnia. Um, he uh, interested me to like working a little bit with uh, three-dimensional objects. But that I did uh, at the end of my work in BFA, I did a big installation of, of a house, which I actually didn't document fully, which I totally regret like 20, uh, I mean, all this time later on. So when your teacher tells you to document your work, like you should totally do that because you're gonna regret it in the future. But later on in grad school, I went back and revisited that idea in a smaller scale when I did a whole series of cardboard houses that somehow resembled the, the slums. The cardboard was like infused with uh, coffee and then the candles will uh, heat up the cardboard and somehow like make this uh, fragrance of coffee at the same time that will create a little bit of a cast shadow in the back or reflective light uh, in the form of more slums. But it was somehow like an idea to, to go against that infrastructure that it seems to be really like deteriorate and somehow scary. But some, sometimes like that's like the most, uh, the most safe place for a family to grow because what is important is the light inside and the family itself. Then I was introduced to relief print making by a friend from Korea um, that saw my need to somehow try to uh, get this sense of graphic quality into my work. And it was that moment when I pulled my first print that everything changed for me. I was introduced to the dark side of printmaking. So th with the process of relief printmaking, I have been able to uh, explore more of that visual narrative, uh, incorporating iconography from Latin America and also from other places where I have been living. Sometimes trying to understand the juxtaposition between the houses of the middle class the situation in the United States where I was living and also the slums where I was, um, where I grew up. But at the same time, you know, like, not everything was just about the infrastructure of the house. It was also this idea of somehow um, explore the, the sense of unconditional love, you know, that a family has in order to, like, continue growing. And I started to explore some of the characters that were around um, uh, the town where I was uh, going to school, especially in Moscow, Idaho. And one day I was just sitting in a bar uh, doing some sketching and I saw um, a lady performing um, uh, in a jazz band, but she was carrying her baby at the same time. And it was beautiful because she was singing and it was just this amazing performance. But at the same time, the, her baby was just resting so calm in her arms. And it was just like one um, representation of that unconditional love where we, as the audience, we were able to listen or perceive like that beautiful moment between, intimate moment between a mother and her child. So just to tell you a little bit how I go into the process of relief printing, I basically just sketch ideas on a piece of paper after I have conversations with people or after I watch some movies.
Hello? Ah, no, you're fine. Yeah, so um, basically, I mean, there is all this uh, stimuli is happening around us all the time. Um, I somehow make sense of them in my head, and then I put them into sketches, and then I draw into a piece of wood, then I apply Sharpie or markers into it to try to develop all these different midtones, and then later on I carve uh, all the negative space and leave a relief on the surface that I uh, pretty much inked on it using a brayer, and then I can pull the prints on it. So this is uh, the piece that actually was selected as best a show uh, for the Paperworks exhibition. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces of all time. It's somehow like this idea of the soup, right? Like uh, when you have the opportunity to eat something that makes you travel in time to that place where you once were uh, a child. In my case, it will be a, a, a soup called Pisca Andina from the Andes in Venezuela. But also like some other characters, you know, like, and that's something like that I, I get asked sometimes, like, where do you get your inspiration? And it's like all around me. This was, uh, for example, a piece that I made by, um, um, based on my friend James Mamoni's dog called JJ when once we were having a beer and he just described him as a little Buddha. And then I just like, that just created an image in my head. And then later on I reproduced that as a reduction drawing, a reduction block actually. So I just wanna show you a little bit of like some in progress like work and how I pretty much just use that tiny little tool to somehow carve these large pieces. And later on, like develop like uh, all these different like mid tones that somehow combine different um, iconography in rendering everything into a whole visual narrative. But at the same time, you know, I had the opportunity not only to explore just the idea of home, but also like some of the realities around uh, what I see around in the community where I, I have been living. Like in the case of this piece right here, the ambition of one open many. It's somehow like a, just like an interpretation of how I see pretty much sometimes the system here in the United States where like everybody's just somehow like trying to get on top of the other person. But at the end you're, I mean sometimes like you're pretending to wear this mask that shows a smile when in deepening yourself you're not feeling that way. But then going back to Venezuela, I had the opportunity to spend some time with uh, my family in the Andes and go back to uh, recognize one of the most special uh, places in every house, which is the kitchen, where we get the opportunity to somehow pass down all these different recipes and um, foods that uh, have been carried on from generations. So this right here is a humble kitchen from uh, the, the Andes, from my cousin's home, where you can see like, you know, there is all this sense of like sun and vibrancy, you know, coming out with all the beautiful smells of coffee and arepas, which is this cornmeal um, dish that we do in the mornings also how infusing our experience right there, that sometimes I will compare with the apartment where I was living in, in Moscow, Idaho, that was a little bit colder, a little bit more like artificial and somehow sometimes full of like canned food. But also some things that I really enjoy is just this idea of growing and but I still have that spirit of become, or being a child while we are becoming adults. Somehow I enjoy like spending time with my little cousins and see them growing because they have this beautiful imagination that somehow I feel that when we grow old, like we are learning to like somehow like disregard as something that is not useful in our community. But I will say that that's something that we need to protect and um, it's gonna be eventually like enriching our creative mind and also our visual narratives when we make them for other people. So this piece right here is kind of like an interpretation of that. This is a moving truck that we use back home, and it's somehow carrying all these childhood memories of chocolate, of like playing around, of reading books, you know, like, or just like playing around, playing under the rain or in the mud. And that truck is having all, carrying all these memories without any straps on. So somehow like those memories are gonna start to fall when we are moving into the dark, in, <laughs> into our journey to become an adult. It's kind of dramatic, I know, but. It was kind of fun when I did it. So yeah, so that way, you know, like always um, trying to think about like the idea of the relief printing not only has a piece that is just like two dimensional and what is valuable is just a piece of paper, but also the wood itself becomes a piece of uh, kind of like a sculptural. 
But I always, even when I do those variations, I always go back to the idea of the black and white and the large format of pieces where I can really go and dive in into the detail, the textures, and just immerse myself into this narrative that somehow resembles some of the realities that surround me. Like for example, this piece right here, childhood ornaments. We see a reflective view between the, an older version of the self looking at herself right here where she's a courage, uh, um, a very brave little girl in the in the uh, in the house where she wants uh, a little kid, but she uh, they have this um, uh, conversation somehow right there. Um, um, one of them is missing the other part after one of them actually got married. And little by little, um, I had the opportunity to collaborate with other artists and somehow use my uh, pre-making skills to illustrate some of their views on, on some of their books. But at the same time, like once again, as I say, like I always go back to that idea of really like uh, exploring what is going on around me. So um, one thing that I always notice is like when you go around, you always see people's faces. Now it's kind of hard to see that because everybody's we wearing a face mask. But uh, one thing that I always notice is like we always have these layers, um, um, all these things that somehow uh, related to identity that somehow like make us want to like differentiate each other. Like we have culture, like language, and all these different background, e economical backgrounds. But deeply in yourself, like if you do an art piece and somehow show it to other people, you see that there is an evidence of a common understanding of our un uh, common consciousness that we'll share that somehow can make a connection between each other if we just allow ourselves to, exp uh, to express our inner world to others. And that's what I wanted to somehow explore here. Like there is no faces, there is just the exposed inner world where these two people have been somehow growing. One of them coming from the slums and one of them coming from the countryside in Spokane. And even like that, somehow finding a connection between them through the light, po uh, light poles and the telephone poles. So this right here is just uh, a representation of, um, I have been exploring, uh, actually working with uh, students for the last five years, and I feel somehow that there is this sense of an institution and all these different expectations that somehow like create a weight upon them that doesn't allow them to fully be themselves. But I mean, if they are allowed to somehow like break free through that, like by music or by somehow just being themselves, they, it's just a liberating thing that later on like, will allow them to grow even, even better, um, happier at the end. So as I mentioned before, like, I love doing large pieces. I love exploring and creating this tiny little world somehow that resemble like home and the new home where I live. This is just like a little example of like, how I, I pretty much like, attempt to do my work. I just spent uh, la uh, large hours just working little by little, making one carving uh, uh, a mark at the time to later on create these tiny little environments. This piece actually is in the gallery where you can see it later on all printed on fabric. It's gonna be passing and showing you some other pieces. Also some uh, uh, experimentations with uh, using the relief printing and somehow folding it into a three-dimensional piece that later on becomes an installation that also um, incorporates sound and light and also smells, like this series of birds into the beer murmuration. So that's pretty much like the part of like the storytelling that I really enjoy like to, to share with people. But at the same time, uh, one thing that I really enjoy is the collaboration. So I drive a lot of um, inspiration from Brooklyn artist Swan, um, how she uses like the process of um, art making in order to empower others to make a change into their environments. That's something that I have been a big fan of her. Um, I have been also like trying to mimic or use into my own practice in order to somehow contribute to the community where I have been living and create a sense of a change. So um, one thing that I did in grad school was basically just like uh, get inspiration from uh, the University of Montana with Jim Bailey and then just uh, use a steamroller as a way to print large pieces of wood where we were inviting uh, local artists, students, and also the professors from three different universities to come together as equals and just like help each other into printing these large pieces. 
even the president of the school came there to, to help us out and get dirty a little bit and get aware of the art department too, which was great. Um, that uh, uh, project just like took off and now every year we do um, a similar process of steamrolling into um, the, um, the city of Coeur d'Alene where we have all these different universities, students, um, illustrators and artists like coming together and somehow offering a view of the art making process to the rest of the community so we can share that and somehow like make them be part of this like um, exchange process that, that we do with everybody. And also we had the opportunity for artists that had never taken into a relief printing process to somehow like dive in and take into this massive project um, later on like learn a lot from it. So thanks to social media and Instagram, I have been able to collaborate with people from around the country, like in the way of this, of this group that was founded two years ago by Ben Munoz from Texas, called the Siete Printers. The, um, basically, like, it just brought together like seven artists from all, all over the United States to uh, also do a relief printing session in Texas in Corpus Christi in front of like the, the crowd there and in front of the beach. It was really, it was really hot, but it was really awesome. So this right here is just a little video of like how we were pulling some of the pieces. But it's amazing to see, you know, like you can always count on other people, feel vulnerable and somehow like get help from them in order to accomplish these largest pieces that somehow seem kind of like overwhelming at the beginning. So when, after we did all these projects, I always feel that, you know, like it definitely, printmaking has this component that can create community, can somehow like make people come together into things. So I was thinking like, okay, let's go and be a little bit more ambitious, let's go bigger. So I was trying to prove that, and in a way I write this grant for a project that we did at Eastern Washington University where I was an agent there, and I invited seven students from uh, different colleges in the school, in the, in the university, and um, only one of them was a, a visual artist, and to somehow like take into this large project of, of just taking seven panels of eight by five feet each, just draw them, carve them by hand, and then print them and then later on be installed somewhere. But the idea was to basically like take people that have never been exposed to this process and just put them into this really uncomfortable situation and then see what will happen. But then what it was amazing is like how these people at the beginning were really hesitant to make a mark in the, in the block when they were drawing. Then they were kind of hesitant to make a mark to carve these blocks. But then at the end, it was amazing to see them getting empowered about the process and somehow taking ownership into the, the whole massive, the, the massive of, this, uh, of this project. Somehow creating these beautiful marks into it, later on coming together and printing everything by hand and pulling each one of these blocks. And later on, taking over two different classrooms with this beautiful, fresh smell of ink Good thing that we were in, in the middle of like, you know, the spring break to somehow like wrap all the different places in, in paper so no one was mad at us. But then we decided to whip paste these pieces into uh, the same school and to somehow like change a little bit of the space where they always are part of, which is their school. After we did this, we got invited by the RAMPA, which is the regional pre-making conference in, um, in Idaho and Washington in that moment. And we got invited to also with paste our piece in Washington State University. And then later on into the University of Idaho when I went to school. So we were able to take the, that spaces like this one. This, believe it or not, is actually the wall right outside the fine art department, which is pretty sad, right? And then somehow we got to modify that with the incorporation of our piece. So during the regional conference, it was great to see like professional uh, printmakers and also uh, printmaking professors coming and asking the students like what was going on, what type of paper you use, what type of ink you use. And it was amazing to see these people that didn't know anything about relief printing a month ago, just somehow like speaking with property, right? Like they were speaking about the mark making, the ink that they were using, and also the, uh, the wheat pasting process. These seven strangers came back um, has some um, friends 
and they somehow like prove that when we choose uh, we choose to be vulnerable and ask for help with other uh, to other people we can accomplish really amazing things and this is like a picture of the group right there so after this um, i got invited to the university of montana to also continue exploring this idea of exploration uh, sorry uh, collaboration so we went there for a week. Um, we decided to do a series of relief printing with the students that later on we cut, cut out. And we decided to whip paste them into making these circular um, panels that later on the students were using as uh, uh, panels uh, that they were walking around for the parade for the Day of the Dead. But also there was this space right next to the printmaking shop that it was just pretty much dead space. That was where all the people was just pretty much throwing the trash and it was just uh, pretty much full with, with cardboard and paper and just trash. But there was an elevator right there that wasn't being activated for years. So we decided to take all those pieces and we paste them all together and we pretty much like created a huge uh, mosaic and mural in the, in the whole space. That was amazing because Later on, the dean, <laughs> the dean of the college came by, uh, came by and he saw it and he had never been even aware that there was an elevator there. So somehow, like after seeing the piece, he was super excited. So he decided to install lights into the area and now it's an activated space that people use re in regular basis. So it's no longer the space where people just throw the trash. But uh, it somehow like tells, uh, tells you the, the power of art making and print making, where you have this sense of collaboration and somehow you can take ownership of the space surrounding you and you can be part of, um, of, of that space, not only by being there, but also by modifying it too. And of course, you know, the idea of community is really important to my process, you know. Um, it's something that I have been, uh, been exploring since MFA since I finished my MFA, but also after I graduated, when I was trying to find a sense of like community and belonging, because I no longer had like access to a studio and I no longer have access to like uh, uh, art people like I was in school. So it's a little bit of a transition there. But then I started to realize that, you know, social media, I mean, if you have seen the Netflix uh, documentary, it's kind of like a really scary thing. But at the same time, it can be a really powerful tool to somehow connect with other people. I have been able to collaborate with uh, so many artists from around the United States, like in the case of Gregory Santos, which is uh, and this is project uh, Mixed Grid, where he basically sends you, sends you in the mail, believe it or not, a rock, which is a stone little. Uh, a little stone, uh, and then you take that, you draw it on it with a greasy crayon, and then you send it back to him, and then he will print it for you. So um, just like that, and also the Siete Printers project, and then Print Austin, I have been just so um, lucky to have the opportunity to collaborate with so many people uh, in the United States. But then one of the things that was the biggest challenge was like to find a printmaking spot in Spokane where I move. I was basically carving and printing out of my kitchen table when I, was, uh, uh, when I just recently moved to Spokane. I didn't realize how lucky and spoiled I was to have a printmaking shop when I was in school. So, um, so we decided later on to run a uh, write a grant. Um, we developed the RGC Prints and later on what is called the Spokane Print and Publishing Center, which is a nonprofit uh, community print shop where we teach a leather press, a screen printing, relief printing, and zoom etching. And they have becoming this like amazing tool for the community where they have access to print making without paying uh, college tuition. But later on, I also wanted to, because I felt that, you know, we were always in these tiny towns and these tiny cities. Um, we didn't have a lot of festivals going on and all the big things are happening always in the big cities. So we decided to like take on um, into creating what is called the Spokane Print Fest, which is this annual event where we celebrate print making for a full month and we do exhibitions, we do uh, community workshops, we also do a studio visits and we just continue to have and offer this opportunity for students to demonstrate their work with, this, um, with the rest of the community and also for in, in, uh, artists and instructors to just come all together, be in the same plane and just gig into print making and um, educate our community. 
But besides spring making, and late, uh, earlier today, Ryan asked me, like, okay, what, what do you do when you're not, uh, you're, you're not making printing? Because the, the truth is, like, I don't really just do art all the time. But, um, uh, or actually print making. The thing is that I have this fascination for large pieces. I always, that's why I like to do, like, really big, like, relief prints. But the dream is to do large murals. So during the pandemic, I was like pretty much um, doing all this work for to do uh, shows around the country and all these things. But then I realized that I didn't have anything uh, to do with that because uh, because everything was getting canceled. So I had the opportunity to go back and start painting some walls inside the studio where, where we had our a community print shop. And I started diving and understanding like this this thing that I always wanted to do. So with the help of Instagram, I started like studying some things, getting some books, and little by little I started developing um, uh, some large pieces that somehow like take away from all the different methods that I use for drawing and also for relief printing and combining them into the way that I can pretty much make a mark making in order to create uh, these large murals too. And after I started doing these things, I got invited by our city in, in Spokane uh, to collaborate with other 15 artists uh, from the city, and we painted this uh, one of the largest murals in in Spokane related to the Black Lives Matter. So each one of us, like, basically took one leather and painted, um, pretty much like um, activated that space that have been creating a lot of dialogue. But of course, you know, one other thing that I do besides teaching is daydreaming. So I keep daydreaming about like the opportunity to continue to modify the spaces around our city. Um, somehow activating this larger canvas that we see around in these largest uh, in these large buildings that are surrounding us. So I started to, uh, with the help of my friend um, Laurie Weaver, we started like photographing these places and then later on uh, doing um, digital paintings on it. That later on we started to release little by little in the social media in the hopes to uh, communicate these ideas to the rest of the community and eventually activate these canvases that are going to definitely contribute to the visual identity and the creative identity of our city, as you can see right here, for example, in the Riverfront Park. And besides all these things, I also got invited to collaborate with what is called the Pine Copper Line, which is a printmaking podcast with my friend Miranda uh, Metcalf, Miranda Metcalf from Australia, that's now in, in Thailand. Um, we collaborate uh, doing in, in interviews with different printmaking artists from around the United States and also around the world. So I have been able to um, collaborate with her and taken into uh, on, into the hosting of the Spanish version of all these different different uh, um, collaborations and, and talks that we do with different artists. artists. So uh, having a, uh, we have been able to collect all these different ideas um, and conversations with, with artists for an hour and an episode. Um, and basically create this kind of archival where, archive where we basically document the process of pre-making in different countries. So thank you so much for your time. Um, appreciate that. And I think we have, oh, thank you. Whew, that was a lot of talking. Um, yeah, so um, it seems that uh, we have some time for questions, correct, right? So um, if you have yeah, any we'll questions, it will be amazing. And take some questions. Um, let's see, I have a mic here. I'm going to hunt students down and force them to ask questions if they don't have any. <laughs> I don't know, I might hunt you, Micah. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Um, yeah, or does somebody else do? Yeah. Joanna has a question. Okay. When you're designing your drawings and you're thinking about communicating a narrative, what's your thought process behind that? Are you choosing specific imagery to communicate that? Or... Um, like, how do you go about that aspect of the drawing? Yeah, so thank you. That, that's a really good question. So um, sometimes the imagery gets designed depending on the objective, right? Or what is the purpose of it? So um, if I have an invitation for a wall, um, the drawing is going to be basically like, or the design is going to be um, 
thought specifically for that wall. But when I'm in my own time and I'm just basically just developing our work, I actually have the idea and then try to find the best media for that idea, which I mean, I uh, made the mistake many times to just rely on my comfort zone. But um, I, my wife is actually someone who actually pushed me to keep exploring and incorporating more things into, into the, the art making process. So basically, everything starts by just a stimuli or something that I watch or something that I read. And then that creates a kind of like an image in my head. So I, I, I sketch. I forget about that sketch for like a long time and then I revisit it and somehow everything makes sense. So then I can imagine like, okay, that could be a really interesting uh, relief print or that potentially could be a mural or that potentially could be a t-shirt design. So that's basically how I do that. And sometimes I design something for one thing and then I realize that, I mean, it's okay, it's already done. And then I revisit it and I try to incorporate it into another media. But yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I first came across your work through the Mixed Grit uh, Instagram page, and I was just wondering, like, how was that process for you? The Mixed Grit? Yeah. So basically what happens is, like, you start making your work in your studio, and you document it and put it on the social media. And eventually people start, like, liking it and following, and somehow, like, you make, uh, uh, they, they are aware of your work. So Gregory Santos, which is a, a print master, the master printer actually from the art gym in uh, in Denver, he's, he came across to my work and he basically just invited me to do it. So he selects four artists every three months and he chips the stone to you and then you basically draw on it and then chip it back. So that's basically how it went. Did you have... Uh, any experience with stone lithography before that? So I did one list, uh, little little stone um, in grad school that I didn't really finish. I just draw it, I print it, but I didn't really solve it fully. But I had an idea how it, the, the crayon would feel. But this time, actually, I have to do a lot of try and error on the stone itself. So um, I was doing a little bit of mark making and realizing that the marks were not really like portraying what I wanted. So I have to somehow like cover them while I was developing the drawing. And at the end, somehow it all came out together and worked out. So yeah, not a lot of experience. It was kind of like the first time, second time. I have a question from uh, one of our students that's currently watching online. Uh, and their question was, in one of your your woodcut prints, um, like how much time is invested in you know both like the drawing and then carving, printing, and then if you have multiple colors, carving and printing again. He wanted to know how how long it usually takes you to complete one of your prints. Yeah, so um, if I don't have a deadline, it will take forever. You know, it just takes years, right? which I have some pieces that I, I still haven't finished since grad school, they're still there. But I mean, a deadline definitely helps. But in general, depending on the size, like for example, the piece that you saw on the show, um, the, the one that got the, the first prize, the, the soup one, that one, it was a challenge because we were, I traveled to St. Louis to uh, work with an artist called Tom Hawk. So um, we were 15 artists in total living in the print shop for 10 days. So um, basically I just have to draw, carve, and print the piece in 10 days, which I never attempted to do. But besides that, um, it pretty much takes me like three to four days to draw the block. And it takes me, I, I have been getting faster, so I can do probably like three days or a week to carve the, the piece, depending on the size. And then like the printing process, which is the part that I don't like at all, it, that takes me a little bit longer sometimes, but I have been able to just make it quicker because I don't like it, so I can make it as efficient as I can. So that usually takes me like six to eight hours. So the whole process, I mean, to make a piece, like it can take me from three to four weeks in, in, in total. Thank you. Um, before I go to another online question, do we have any other questions from students in here? Do you need a little bit more time to think? Okay. Uh, from another one of our students online, Hannah is asking, um, for the, the really large prints, um, 
and not necessarily ones that you've run through a steamroller, but they're curious how you go about printing those if you don't have the ability for like a press of that size. Yeah, you, um, that's a good question. So I would say, I would say this, you over ink your plate. So you basically apply way more ink than you need. And second, you can use a um, wooden spoon. It takes a little bit longer, right? But it works really well. So you basically take that wooden spoon and you just like burnish the back of the page and you can print really large pieces like the ones that we did that was like the seven panels. We use uh, barrels and also we use uh, uh, wooden spoons. Um, and that's great because it allows you to check the print, um, continue to ink certain areas that you need to retouch and your prints at the end are gonna be great. But make sure to use a paper that is really thin like Kitakata or like Japanese papers that are really, really fine. So that way the print is gonna be rich and black or, or rich and saturated. But if you use like paper that is a little bit thicker, it's gonna take you forever. It requires pressure in order to do that. So I'll say that. <laughs> so how many of you are art students here? Awesome. How many of you have done printmaking? Oh, great. It's a good group. Um, I, I have a question actually yes, from, my, from myself. Uh, so you, you've kind of stated how important um, collaborative work is to your printmaking practice and trying to involve uh, community. Um, uh, besides kind of like the local projects that you've done in, in Mixed Grit and the, the Pine Copper Lime podcast, are, are there any other kind of concepts that you're exploring or things that you're thinking of for the future? I mean, either using social media or... Um, yeah, so the, with the idea of the, for example, I'm just gonna tell you about something that's really exciting, uh, Pine Copper Lime. Uh, I have been able, so when it was, uh, I have been able to like document um, conversations with uh, people from Venezuela, especially artists from Venezuela. So um, when I was in grad school, I was trying to write my thesis and I couldn't find any information regarding uh, printmaking in, in Venezuela. So once I went back, I found a, a print shop and I realized that there was so much history there that I wasn't aware of. And the only problem was that no one had documented any type of the printmaking in Venezuela for the last 25 years. So one thing that I did was in the Pine Copper Lime, I had an interview with the master printer of the print shop. And we talked a little bit about the, those issues. And one project that I have in mind is to uh, travel to Venezuela and do a series of documentary film where we are going to all these different places where people continue to print, uh, uh, to do, to use the process of printmaking in Venezuela, despite all the different like economical uh, difficulties that we have. Um, somehow make a, uh, a documentary about it. Um, um, somehow like bring attention to that practice that have been really rich, but it's just like, it's not, um, it haven't been, um, documented for other people to appreciate. So that's something that I, uh, I'm looking forward to do uh, in the next couple years. Awesome. Ronaldo, I'm interested in kind of st routine, studio routines, or how do you clean out distractions? I mean, you're doing a lot of things here, but as far as uh, your, your, your family, you're managing your Instagram, you're, you're working, of course, obviously with the administrative things, trying to get, to, get into shows and, and do these collaborative projects, uh, you're teaching. Uh, how do you kind of manage all that, and is there any advice you could give to us about that? Yeah, so um, I'm a little bit like kind of like hyperactive, so as you can notice. And so I, when I get really excited about something, I just want to do it, and I just continue doing it. But I, it's true, like balancing is one of those things that I have been learning. For example, now that I became an assistant professor in Gonzaga for the last three months, um, I have been learning to, you know, like I need to somehow dedicate a certain times to certain things. So um, I have been better to create a schedule. So I carry around my little book uh, with my calendar there, and I make sure to schedule time for every single thing that I need to do, especially uh, even family time. 
and I try to stick to that and I try to preserve it and protect it. And if something is coming and trying to take that time away, um, I have been learning to say no to, which is pretty difficult sometimes. But, but that, that would be my biggest advice. Like just try to find um, a schedule, try to write the things down there, put time for it. Um, I mean, if you say that you're gonna work on something 30 minutes, just work on that 30 minutes and then after that you move on. Sometimes you're not gonna finish it and you need to reschedule it. But I mean, sticking to that, protecting that time really, really helps. And also one other thing too is the, um, I have a lot of projects that I haven't finished too. You know, there is a lot of things that I haven't completed and um, they're still kind of haunting me. But at the same time, like when you get excited, really excited about something, you're gonna be able to like really commit to it. Um, and it's so rewarding at the end. But I mean, I used to spend a lot of time in my phone and that's something that I have been trying to like curate. Um, now uh, I used to like scroll in Instagram like crazy and go into these rabbit holes. Now I try to think about Instagram as a tool to promote the work and connect with people. So I, when I get access to it, I try to do that. And one thing that I, I would recommend for everybody is to sleep. Sleep really helps. I just do like pull, <laughs> all night is all the time like when it was in college and it was amazing but yeah like when you have a good night's sleep like everything is just clearer and you can work on things too but breaking everything down into smaller smaller tasks that you can complete through the day like at the end um it's um it's amazing what you can accomplish so i'm still learning <laughs> a lot but yeah that's a really good question thank you that that probably brings us to our time. Uh, I yeah. think one more in. quick one, I yep. think, from online. Uh, one one quick question. Um, I have a student who's curious, like when you when you're doing your your drawings or when you're preparing for a print, um, if you have a, a really concrete idea of the imagery that you're going to use in that print and how it's mm -hmm. going to turn out, or if it's more organic of a process once you start. Yeah, so that depends, you know, if I'm doing, for example, a teacher, a teacher, teacher design, I have a concrete idea of the thing and I try to reproduce that. But the reality is that in the process of printmaking, you have three main things. You have the drawing part, you then become a carver, and then you become a printer. So the image itself is going to evolve, your idea is going to evolve, and if you allow the ideas to evolve and, take, and, and grow by themselves, at the end, you're gonna be really surprised. So I just don't um, push that away. I just embrace it. And at the end, like I get images that are uh, totally different sometimes to what I was thinking at the beginning. So it's totally fine to like to do that, and I, and I really enjoy that. And I realize that that's the way that I work. So I have been embracing it too. So yeah. So things change and evolve and mutate. So. All right. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much for your time. Again, come by uh, tomorrow, tonight, today, or tomorrow to check out things that are happening up there in the printmaking studio and see uh, how Ronaldo is is making progress. Yep, and uh, a reminder that we will also be um, having a, uh, a reception and live viewing of Ronaldo's exhibition at the Northwest Art Center tonight at 6:30. Will also be streamed online. <laughs>